Hello, my name is Neve Brennan. I'm the archivist for Donegal County Council. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of our online collections. Donegal County Archives are the archive service of Donegal County Council. The archive service seeks to preserve the inheritance of the people of Donegal for present and future generations by preserving, acquiring and making accessible the documented heritage of the county. Our collections include our public collect collections, which are, for example, Donegal County Council's own collections, local authorities that are no longer in existence, such as the Rural District Councils or the Donegal Grand Jury, Boards of Guardian Records, Urban District Councils, County Committee of Agriculture. We have other public records, for instance, school records and St. Colin's Hospital. And we have privately acquired records, including estate papers, collections of individuals, literary, sporting and photographic collections and oral history accounts. The first collection I'm going to talk about today is the Donegal Grand Jury. The Grand Jury is our oldest public collection and our records date back to 1753. The Grand Jury was the main local authority that existed before the County Council. It was not democratic. Wealthy landowners were appointed to the Grand Jury by the High Sheriff of the County. Their, re their remit included making and repair of roads and bridges, construction of courthouses, support of district hospitals, schools and prisons. Many people living in poor rented accommodation across the county resented having to pay the grand jury cess. This was a rate payable by occupiers. They also greatly resented having no vote in the appointment of grand jury members and the corruption in the system. The grand jury were not interested in being popular because they were not accountable to the public. It did not dawn on members that there was anything wrong with ordering cases of wine from, from Dublin for their dinner during the famine at the cost of ratepayers, and a short time later trying to reduce the diet of people admitted to Lifford Jail, because they argued the diet was so good it was encouraging people to commit petty crimes so that they would get well fed in the jail. This was in 1849. The Grand Jury of Donegal sometimes lobbied the Lord Lieutenant for various improvements in the county. One example of this is in 1851 when they sought to have more police in Donegal due to the ongoing land disturbances protests at eviction and destitution in rural Donegal during the famine years. They complained that for its size and location, the county of Donegal should have far more constables. Their wish, however, wasn't granted by the Lord Lieutenant. Donegal Grand Jury's archives are online and free to view. We have minutes of meetings and contracts, assize records, financial records and correspondence, as well as a photograph of the last grand jury. The records are useful for family and local history because they contain names of grand jurors, staff, contractors, tradespeople, rates collectors and others. This is the website here. If you go, if you click on the catalogue, you'll see all the records that are available and the reference numbers. And then if you go back into the main website, you'll be able to see all the records that are there and you can click on any one of these and have a look at the actual archive itself. These were microfilmed records and the microfilms were digitized and put online last year. The originals are in the county archives and they can be viewed by appointment at the archives itself in Lifford. Another of our collections that can be viewed online are the 19th century workhouse records, poor law union records or board of guardians, which date from 1840. The British government passed the Poor Law Act in 1838 and divided the country of Ireland into poor law unions, each one run by an area board of guardians. The principal responsibility of the boards was to build and run workhouses for the destitute of the county. Workhouses in Donegal were built in Letterkenny, Ballyshannon, Stranorder, Dunfanaghy, Carndona, Donegal, Glenties and Milford. There are minute books, admission registers and other archival items such as diet books and dispensary records. And these tell the stories about people, young and old, families and individuals from across the county who were evicted from their homes or who were in dire poverty and couldn't support themselves and were forced to spend time in the dreaded workhouse. In April 1861, hundreds of people were evicted from their homes in Derry Bay. Glenvay, and many of them had to seek shelter in the workhouse in Letterkenny. 
Most people were too proud to want to spend any time in the workhouse. And when an inspector from the workhouse visited the area in May that year, he found men and women living literally on the land near their destroyed cottages, who told him in no uncertain terms that he wasn't welcome there and that nothing would make them go into the workhouse. But unfortunately, many did have to go there. The Letterkenny Workhouse Admission Register for 1861 lists dozens of people admitted to that workhouse in April and May. It lists whole families such as Mary and Patrick Devenny and their two small children, Hannah and Patrick. Many mothers and children were admitted, such as Sally Coyle and her one-year-old daughter, Margaret. Many others left Derry Bay or the workhouse only to have to emigrate to America or Australia. The Poor Law Union records are available online at Find My Past www.findmypast.ie and there is a charge for that service. They're also available to view for free at Donegal County Libraries when they reopen, when all the um, services are reintroduced. and they're, they're free of charge. Some Board of Guardian Minutes are online at our own website, donegalcoco.ie. All the PDFs, PDFs will eventually be put up online and all the records are available to view in the research room in Donegal Archives when we reopen. I'm now going to talk about some of our private collections and I'm going to start with the Lifford Jail Turnkey Report. Sadly, it seems that few records have survived from Lifford Jail. The jail itself was built in 1793 beside the courthouse in Lifford. The prison was divided into different sections and it's interesting to note that there were cells for ordinary pris prisoners, there were debtors' apartments, lunatic wards and a hospital. The jail was demolished in 1907. You can see what an imposing structure it was in its day. The Turnkey Report is a handwritten register which details life for ordinary prisoners in Lifford Jail. The earliest date for this book is 1829. The Turnkey's duty was to enter the names of all prisoners who we shall find misconducting themselves or who shall have been reported to him either by an officer of the prison or by a wardsman. The Turnkey recorded daily tasks given to the prisoners, including the distribution and collection of hammers for yard breaking. All work given to prisoners was reported daily. Every day the cells in the jail were meticulously inspected. Reports on every aspect of prison life was recorded. Reports include punishments meted out to prisoners for various infractions of duties of, of the rules. These included disruptive behaviour, fighting with prisoners, threatening officers or disobeying orders, cells not being kept clean or tidy, and even for speaking Irish. Punishments included time spent in solitary confinement and deprivation of certain supplies, particularly milk. A couple of quotes from this report include from the 8th of August, 1829. John Duncan to be placed in solitary confinement for three days for refusing to obey the order of the governor and giving up his hat to be placed in store after a cap had been offered to him by order of the inspector. Another one was from the 11th of August that year. The milk of James Dillon, Patrick Gubbin, Edward Gubbin and James Donald stopped for idling their time from work. And December that year, the turnkey reports that he visited the house at one o'clock. James Gallagher, Tom Ferry and Hugh Duffy speaking Irish to their wives at the door. The milk of James Gallagher, Tom Ferry and Hugh Duffy to be stopped for one day for speaking Irish contrary to their regulations. And you can see that book, that Liverpool Jail report book online on our website. I'm going to move on now to the Gudor Hotel books, which are also online. In the 1830s, the Gwydor Hotel was built by local landowner Lord George Hill, brother of the Earl of Downshire. We have two visitors' books for the Gwydor Hotel. And these are wonderfully entertaining items. The hotel was hugely popular with wealthy tourists from Ireland and abroad. Lord George Hill acquired much of the land in northwest Donegal. By some, he was regarded as a good reforming landlord, though there, were plenty of, though there was plenty of local opposition to his reforms particularly during the 1850s when he brought in tenants from Scotland for the purpose of large-scale sheep grazing. This was similar to what John Adair did in 1816 during mass evictions from Derry Bay. This escalation is the famous Sheep War of Gwydor. The visitors' books contain very detailed descriptions of the land, the landlord, the hotel, the area and the overall situation in Gwydor from 1842 to 1874. They also contain comments on emigration and the famine, there were many notable visitors there, including William Robert Wilde, father of Oscar Wilde, John Mitchell, a young, the Young Irelander, uh, Thomas Carlyle, to name but a few, members of the Downshire family. 
There are also many visitors from the surrounding counties whose remarks on the changes to the area they witnessed are perhaps of even greater significance. People often wrote in praise of Hill's effort, even during the famine. I have often visited the Guidor Hotel, but had no period of greater pleasure than this, wrote one person. The deep and heartfelt interest Lord George Hill is now at such an awful crisis of distress and famine, owing to the total failure of the potato crop, showing how to alleviate the probable wants of his tenantry. Would to God there was a Lord George Hill in every parish in Ireland. But not everyone loved the landlord. For example, one man penned a rhyme to describe his view of the local situation. For sheep destruction, landlord rule and comfort rich and rare, Guidor is famed through Aaron's Isle, this notebook doth declare. But tenant slaves are crouching here beneath their tyrant sway and grimly curse the hour their moors became the Scotchman's prey. Others had a less serious take on matters. A number of visitors expressed their sentiments in comic verse, such as this. Again and again in Guidora have been, again and again all its beauties I have seen, yet never have felt enmity, fatigue or chagrin, for ale such as here a cure cannot fail. If you're fond of good sherry, good port and good ale, and you're cured of all ales, 1844. Now going to look at the collection of um, papers relating to Rockhill House and Letter Kenny. These are this is a register, a bound register of co copied letters from Robert Rankin Robinson, land steward of Rockhill House and Ard's House. And his letters are mainly they're mainly letters from uh, Robinson himself to General Char Charles Stewart, who owned all the property. The register relates to the everyday workings of the estates, to ordering thing, ordering seeds, working the sheep farm, chickens, soldier boat, training of horses, looking after calves, and the interestingly one is the purchase of a newfangled Victorian churn. And this is the documentation about it here on the right, and an image from the internet of a Victoria churn on the left. There are also descriptions of the wages that were paid to workers on the land. The effects of storms, there were some fierce storms, destroy trees and, and the land and parts of the land at times. Planting of trees, the sale of timber and hay, rainfall, etc. But some letters of a more personal nature and reflect Rankin's friendship with the general. Included are letters in 1893 and 94 on the subject of the dreaded influenza, influenza or flu. Rankin Robinson kept his boss informed about his and his wife's progress in recovering from a particularly bad dose of the flu, stating that the disease was unfortunately prevalent in the neighbourhood, adding that Mr Boyd of Convey House and 10 others in the area were suffering from it. He also thanked the general for paying the doctor's bill for him. In 1894, he wrote that he had a return of this nasty disease over the last few months and expressed delight to receive a present of a pocketbook from Mr Stewart. There are also copies of letters from other people, including from his daughter, Sarah Jane Robinson, to a Miss Bailey in June 1894. Excuse me, stating that she has been sewing at Miss Ramsey's for the past fortnight and is tired when she comes home on Saturday night, that the distance is too far to walk to go to Sunday school. She says she will attend occasionally when she feels strong enough to do so, and she states that her parents are both well. I'm going to skip a few decades now and talk about the Fannet District Nursing Association, or Fannet Health Club, as it was also known. The Queen's Institute of District Nursing was, was established in Ireland in the late 19th century, and its remit was to train nurses to assist the poor and sick at home. District nursing associations, also called health clubs, were set up to manage the scheme locally, and the committees were run by volunteers, usually wealthy or of some standing in the community. The Lady Dudley scheme set up in the early 1900s was affiliated to the Queen's Institute. Nurses' duties included midwifery and maternity, child welfare, care of the old, treatment of tuberculosis and other diseases, assisting with nutrition, diet and hygiene, including teaching, teaching people ways to avoid diseases such as typhoid and diphtheria. Two people played a vital role in the setting up of Fanet Health Club in 1931-32. The County Medical Officer, Dr Sean O'Dega, who you see here in this photograph, standing at the back, with his, uh, standing at the back of the picture with his arms behind his back, and Miss Edith Rosemond Chichester Hart, who was sitting in the front in the middle. The latter, born in 1893, was the daughter of a well-known botanist, Henry Chichester Chart, Hart, excuse me, and Edith Susan Donnelly. Miss Hart lived in the family home in Carabla House, Port Salem. In 1931, Dr. O'Dega was asked by Miss Hart to help organise what was to become the health club of Fanet. 
Members of households throughout that area paid a subscription to available service. The first nurses to be appointed were Margaret Elizabeth O'Dell from Sligo and Kathleen Clancy from Galway. And these were very um, um, these these ladies were very well qualified. More nurses were appointed as time went on, and they worked extremely hard, hard cycling across the peninsula, visiting at all hours of the day and nights of the week. By 1935, Donegal had more district nurses than any other country, than any other county. Excuse me. By then, sadly, the tireless Dr. Dega had died, age 42, of complications with appendicitis. It was very sad. His sudden death occurred just a few months after he had married Dr. Tracta Halpenny, a pathologist from Dublin. But nurses O'Dowd and Clancy were still going strong and fanned, as is evident from an article entitled In Wildest Donegal, The Nursing Mirror and Midwives Journal in 1935. The writer of the article noted that there had been an increase in membership over the three years of the club, as many a farmer's wife saved the pennies by rigid economy in order to contribute a share for the family. Nurse Kathleen Clancy was interviewed briefly for the article. She didn't stay long to talk to the interviewer, saying, I have one more late call to make before I get home. The interview ends with this paragraph. The rain had come and the wind was blowing gustily, but Nurse Clancy smiled aside my suggestion that she should wait, mounted her bicycle and pedalled into the storm, one hand holding together the skirts of her waterproof coat. The collection includes minutes and correspondence and photographs, flyers, posters, fundraising material, newspaper cuttings and reports of the association. I'm now going to talk about another 20th century item that's online on our website and it is a social and cultural study of crofter life on the West Donegal seaboard, a thesis written in two volumes by Patrick O'Neill back in 1940. It's a fascinating social and economic thesis. The first volume is divided into two volumes and the first volume is divided into chapters. There are chapters on West Donegal's climate, soil, agriculture, for instance corn, manures, potatoes, crop location etc transhumans, or as we know it, bullying, livestock, rundale, congestion and land tenure, on home industries, fishing, curls, and housing. It has many different topics. The second volume is very interesting. It includes hand-drawn statistical maps of Donegal, some of which you'll see here, including of structural features of a sea curve. It also includes a sketch of the crofter's lime kiln, drawings of spools and a pot for holding yarn, and many different types of houses along the western seaboard, plus older types of what, the, what he was calling copter dwelling cottages. There are black and white photographs from across western Donegal, including of the upper Finn Valley, and houses and cottages in places such as Teelan, Ranafast, and also in County Meath, as comparison, and also in, in Norway. So this collection is very interesting just to see the changes that have, have been, and there you see a patched cottage there. It's very interesting for many different reasons, family, local history, their geology, geography, many different aspects of history. But the last online collection we're going to look at today is a political collection, a collection of papers relating to Joseph Murray. Joseph Murray was born in Monon and moved to Bundorn in his late teens after qualifying as a teacher. Cleary identified as a man with leadership qualities from a young age. In late 1917, Murray organised a company of the volunteers in Bundorn. During the crucial 1918 general election, dominated by Sinn Féin, Murray campaigned for Sinn Féin candidate PJ Ward in Killybegs and the surrounding area. PJ Ward became one of the three Donegal members of the first doll in 1919. Murray's work included organising Irish volunteer companies into battalions in South Donegal in 1919. Bundorn was the number one battalion with companies from Bundorn, Ballyshannon, Billick and elsewhere in South Donegal. From mid-1920 to mid-1921, this saw the greatest level of IRA activity in South Donegal during the War of Independence. Murray became involved in various raids and attacks on the Royal Irish Constabulary and British forces, including raid on the Customs Office in Ballyshannon, in May 1920. 
Other activities included a raid on the RIC barracks in Balik in September 1920. In April 1921, Murray was elected Vice Officer Commanding, or OC, at a meeting of battalion staff and company officers. After the merger by the RIC of the father of the captain of the Kinloch Company, Murray became more openly active. Shortly after this, he directed a raid on Bundoran Railway Station and the destruction of Belfast goods, which had been boycotted by the IRA. Raids on post offices and businesses in Bundoran continued until the truce on the 11th of July 1921. Included in the collection are army manuals, memoranda and telegrams, and reports on activities from the 1st Battalion, 4th Brigade. Included are letters from British prisoners of war, including soldiers Albert Thompson and Albert York, both of them captured by the IRA during the War of Independence. When the War of Independence came to an end with a truce in July 1921, Murray's papers reveal some of the story of the journey to the outbreak of civil war less than a year later. There are letters referring to some IRA members being accused of truce breaches. For example, correspondence between a Colonel Wickham and Ono Duffy relating to the theft of a typewriter from Ballantra railway station. Activities deemed to be acceptable that took place during the truce included the continued training of volunteers and field engineers in battalion and brigade meetings. One of the worst of the breaches of the truce conditions took place from the 27th of May to the 1st of June 1922 in Balik and Pettigo, when battles raged between the IRA and the B-Specials. Several documents refer to these crucial events, which resulted in the death of four members of the IRA and several B-Specials. The Joseph Murray collection was kindly donated by his son Patrick a few years ago. The collection was listed and then digitised, and now it is all online and free to view. And, we, and it, is particularly, we, it was done with the help of Creative Ireland, funding. So I'd like to thank you very much for coming to this talk. We have many different sources online which you can view, including exhibitions and publications um, and education materials, as well as our archive sources. The archive sources, we hope to um, extend them as the years progress, particularly in this year and the next year. So thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of Valchina Festival 2021. Slán.